Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Amid the appalling toll of civilian death in Syria, the loss of hundreds of doctors and medical staff stands out as an especially grievous loss. Many have been bombed in their clinics and hospitals. My guest today is David Knott, a British surgeon who spent decades offering his services in conflict zones, including Syria. Now he's focused on training doctors to work in conflict conditions. But does Syria tell us medical personnel can no longer expect any protection in war? David Knott, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. We last spoke in the studio uh, three years ago, 2013. You'd just come back from Syria. Uh, I asked you then, would you continue to go and work in the midst of war? And you smiled and you said, yes, of course. Now, you've been back once since in 2014, but not for the last couple of years. Yeah. Why? I did go back in 2014. I, went, I wanted to go back to Aleppo. I wanted to go and see the friends and people that I'd trained and see how they'd be getting on. I wanted to help them. I wanted to just be with them. And it was a real joy actually to go back in September, October 2014 and to spend six weeks with them. And I was absolutely delighted to see how, they, how they'd coped. I mean, they were from being a ragtag bag of uh, amateurs really um, a year before that and not knowing how to stitch properly, not knowing how to make the right diagnoses, not knowing how to really operate, they turned themselves into a very first class group of very good surgeons. And I'm talking about surgeons that were 28, 29 and 30, and they really were very good. And it was a joy actually to see that the training that they'd actually had, had actually really paid off. And they enjoyed showing me how they could operate and it was really enjoyable. Well, that's the positive. The negative is that you were there in the midst of uh, a spate of barrel bombs, attacks on civilian areas in rebel-held parts of Aleppo. Would it be fair to say that it, it, even for a man who has risked his life in conflict zones for t 20 years, that it, it simply now is too dangerous? Well, I did go, and, and 2014 was completely different to 2013. The, the barrel bombs that were being dropped, they were four or five barrel bombs a day being dropped on the city and on civilian populations. And we dealt with really terrible injuries, the, probably the worst injuries I'd ever seen. Uh, fragmentation wounds on families and children, and it was very difficult. And they were coming in with smoke inhalation and people would die because of respiratory failure following their operations. I, th I, think, I think you said at the time uh, that something like 70% of the casualties were children under 10. That's exactly right. 70% were children under 10. And that was the most heartbreaking part of the whole thing. Because basically, these barrel bombs were being dropped on civilian houses. And of course, the fathers or, uh, would be out working or doing something. And the mothers would be looking after children, four or five children. And they'd be the ones that were coming in. It was, a re it was really, really terrible. And so I was dealing with that sort of injuries um, in the midst of hearing barrel bombs being drop, dropped, hearing planes going around. And in fact, one day we went for a walk uh, to visit another hospital and we were targeted by a Syrian jet that was flying around, firing rockets. And so it was extremely dangerous. Uh, and of course, at the time as well, um, we had 20 or 30 kilometres away Raqqa uh, and ISIS and, and the beheadings of, of all the Westerners. So it made me feel extremely uneasy. And of course, there was only one road in and one road out, the Castello Road. And of course, even at that time, 2014, late to October, mm. there were discussions about closing that road. It's nearly two years on from, from when you were there in those ghastly conditions. Do you now feel that you suffered, or maybe are still suffering, post-traumatic stress? Because we talked about that in 2013 and you were pretty confident you'd, you'd steered clear of that but I wonder how you feel about it now. No, I did suffer from post-traumatic stress, there's no doubt about it. I, I often say that you know a small ember would get into a fire and make me go into a rage and I didn't re quite realise at the time that I was almost having a personality change. My wife now who 
was with me during this time really suffered and, and occasionally still does suffer when things don't go to plan and I, I, I lose the, the plot slightly when it comes to listening to what's going on at the moment. And I, I do put myself back in that situation and I, I, I do suffer, there's no doubt about it. Do you see images, I mean particular images, because even just with me now you're talking about the, 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 the barrel bombs and, and the concrete dust and the children's ravaged bodies. Do, do images come into your head? They do and I'm seeing them now I, and I see it when I go to bed, I see it when I, I, I have constant uh, communication with my colleagues in uh, Aleppo and by WhatsApp and they discuss cases with me and they send me photographs of the most awful injuries that I look at and of course I deal with trauma in this country most of its blunt trauma occasional stabbing very occasionally a, a low energy gunshot wound to the chest or something but there I'm seeing images which is, would make the hearts of anybody basically sink because they're terrible terrible images and they're and they're asking me David what can I do with this case? What, what shall I do? And so I'm sitting there sometimes at a dinner or something underneath the table tapping away saying, well, have you done this? Have you done that? What I would do now and I'd do this. How much blood have you got? You know, what's the neurology like? Is, uh, is the spinal cord damaged? And constant images come to me constantly all the time. There are hundreds of thousands of civilians living in the rebel, still rebel-held parts of Aleppo. Latest reports suggest there are perhaps 38 doctors, of whom maybe a handful are, are actual surgeons. How on earth are these people being given any meaningful health care at all, and, and given that they're still under bombardment? Well, it's, of course it's worse now, and in fact since the siege of Aleppo and since the Russians really scared, ramped up their airstrikes and bombing, they are not coping and they're really dealing with mass casualties on a, mass, on a daily basis. I'm getting pictures on my phone saying, David, look how many cases that we're dealing with now. And we don't have any blood, we don't have much equipment and we're doing operations which, you know, are not the right operations to do in this circumstance. And they decide, making terrible decisions on whether they, they can operate on a child, leave a child, operate on a, somebody else. And they're really not coping. And, it, and that is the big problem. Do you ever feel, and we've talked about the safety aspect and, and the impossibility of, of getting in in many ways, but do you ever feel one way or another, I should be there? Yes, I do. and I, And I, really feel, you know, I, I, I sometimes my wife looks at me sometimes and what are you thinking about and you know, why are you gazing into the, into the abyss and I'm thinking about the people that are there, I'm thinking about the doctors, I really want, wanted to be with them to, to help them and, to, and, and the only way I can do it really now is to offer advice over the phone. Well as you say you are in contact with them, I, I know you, you have very difficult conversations, I, I was very struck by one that that you spoke about a, a little while ago, and, and this was with a, a, a young student doctor, I think, that you know quite well, called Abu Wasim, and, mm. and he, I think, sent you a picture of a girl who'd been very badly hurt in a bomb attack, and she'd lost uh, a chunk of her arm and terrible facial mm. damage, and you contacted him and, and said, that's terrible, is she gonna survive? And his response was, Unfortunately, yes. Mm. To me, there's a very in problematic ethical thing going on in Aleppo right now. I mean, if doctors can save a life but are not able to offer any aftercare, rehabilitation, if, if the damage is so severe and the pain so awful, mm. is there a point where saving life, that most literal thing, is counterproductive? It's a very good question and of course there's no right and wrong in the answer to it really but every, a doctor's job is to save human lives and it's to, to alleviate human suffering but of course... Uh, but that, that alleviation but, of suffering may not be happening, the suffering may be in some awful ways prolonged. Exactly, exactly and, and of course the problem is without backup support and you're, what are you going to do with that patient, where are they going to go, they're going to go to a bombed out home, they're going to suffer even more but you, a doctor's job is not to decide on somebody that's going, if, if somebody's in front of you and is dying and you haven't got the equipment to deal with them, you have to let that patient die. But if somebody, somebody comes in and they've got their arm blown off and they're still alive, you cannot 
put them into a corner and say, I'll come back in 10 hours' time and see if you're still alive. You cannot do that. You have to save their life. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult decision to make. It strikes me as a completely different job, doctoring in Aleppo, from the doctoring you do in some of the best, poshest hospitals in London. And I, in a way, there's a very strange disconnect in your life, and maybe it was best encapsulated when you know, you, you've, you've been awarded a, a, an honour in the UK and you, you soon after went to see the Queen and uh, she asked you what it was like in Aleppo and you very honestly said you actually couldn't answer. It, it, you felt your lip trembling and you felt you were going to break down. Yes. I still think about that time really and I, I, I think I'd come back I think about 10 days after being in Aleppo and I was severely traumatised. My really good friend who I worked with, who was an anaesthetist, um, he was great. And the, the picture I got when I walked over the border, somebody sent me a WhatsApp of him in a shroud. He'd just been killed. And I, I arrived home and I was severely traumatised and, and then got this invite um, to go to see Buckingham Palace, go to the Queen, to sit there and have a lunch with her. And it was fabulous. It was a wonderful <laughs> thing. But my brain was not, my mind was not there. It was in Aleppo and it was with all the people and it was, it was with the people I wanted to be with and I was in an environment whereby I, I couldn't speak. She, she asked me, you know, where have you come back from? I said, well, I've just come back from Aleppo and, and how was it? And I could not describe what it was like. I was unable to describe because it was so bad. It was so bad that, that I just sat there and and looked at her and I remember very vividly my bottom lip starting to quiver and I, uh, I and she, she obviously saw this and, um, and then turned to the courtiers and said Let, let's do something else shall we, Let, let's, 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 let's get the dogs in. So the dogs, the, the corgis came in and we, we, we just fed the dogs for the rest of the lunch. Saved you from, in a sense, breaking down? She did. I, if, she'd, if she had continued to ask me, I would have been sobbing. Yeah. Let's talk about what you're doing right now, because as we've established, you're not able to go back, um, but you are focusing on a particular aspect of, of medical assistance, that's training. Training young doctors in conflict surgery, in emergency trauma care. Uh, and I know you've done it on the Turkish-Syria border. You've done it in Yemen as well. How much difference do you think it really makes? Yes, I, I, I think it makes a lot of difference. Um, I think what, what we do is I run this course at the Royal College of Surgeons called the Surgical Training for the Osteo Environment course, which is a five-day course whereby surgeons from all over the world come. They come from... Uh, Austere uh, environment being a sort of euphemism for war zone. Exactly. Uh, or, or austere means you don't have a CT scanner, you don't have an MRI, no. you don't have much blood, and you need to make the right decision for your patient. So, over the 20 years of experience which I've had, I've brought it all together. So we run this course and it's based on a lot of the cases that I've dealt with and how would you manage this and we go through all these scenarios. Uh, uh, but a shorter course um, is called the Hostile Environment Surgical Training course, which is a three-day course which I put everything together. And then with I, I, I've set up with my wife Ellie a foundation called the David Knott Foundation and it basically pays for surgeons to come from all over the world to come on the course but the small course is also paid for our foundation and we take it uh, and we took it to Gaziantep and 30 surgeons That's came over on the Syria border but in Turkey that's exactly right mm. and, and uh, 30 surgeons came over the border and uh, we, we just we taught them everything from top to bottom what they'd need to know as uh, as a surgeon and of course they looked at me and say, well, in fact, we deal with significantly worse injuries, David, that you can show us. And I said, no, we don't. Let's just talk about your injuries. Let's just talk about the correct way of management. So we had this dialogue between all the surgeons that came over. because they, they were saying, well, we've had this terrible case. How would you manage that? So I, I then said, well, we would manage it by, by this technique. But it wasn't just me, it was a group of us as well that went. So there's about four or five mm. that, that go and deliver this course. So it seems to me that's a continuation of your dedicated work trying to improve the healthcare environment in some of the worst situations in the world. I, I see the continuity there with your actual bodily presence on the ground. But, but you seem to have 
actually also gone in a new direction over the last couple of years. You have become phenomenally outspoken and sometimes not just outspoken on, on specific detailed healthcare issues, but on political issues as well. And in particular, on what it seems you feel to be the flagrant violation of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and in the case of Syria particularly, you appear to be pointing a finger of blame at Assad's forces and at the Russians as well. Very much so. I have become far more political because I just think that there needs to be a voice. or The people that are there need a voice. And of course, the only voice that can come from is people that have actually been there because nobody else can talk. If you haven't been there, it's very difficult to wave a flag and say, well, this is what we should do. It's the people that have been there should really uh, voice up uh, and, and say how terrible it all, it all is. And I, I completely understand the point that people would say, well, David, you know, you're not a politician, you're, you're a doctor. You're not a politician and you're not a strategic analyst. And you are a man who for years has offered uh, humanitarian care to all who present themselves to you. You know, the, from the Red Cross to the people you've worked with for many years at Médecins Sans Frontières to many other international medical healthcare organizations, there is a principle of non-partisanship, of independence, of, for the Red Cross in particular, neutrality. And you've walked an awful long way away from that. I have, I have. And I'm very happy to have said that I, you know, I, I'm glad I've done it because somebody needs to speak out. We cannot sit there and, and, and just be basically um, walked over by, by, by what's going on. So I am very voiced up about uh, what's happening in Syria at the moment. But doctors shouldn't take sides, should they? This doctor has. And, and this doctor has taken sides against people being uh, killed and maimed when they shouldn't have been. Children that have got nothing to do with the war, that have no idea of what's going on. And things like that which, are, which happen in front of my eyes, I can't bear to witness anymore. But I mean, this isn't necessarily personal because you're not there at the moment, but, but let, I, I think this is such an important principle, we ought to talk about the theory of it, because if you were able to go back, you know, the Russians in particular, having seen you talk about, I think one phrase, very evocative phrase you used was the brutal dance that yeah. Russia and Syria are carrying out in Aleppo. Mm. Um, you know, the Russians might well take a decision that we're going we're gonna to target that guy not. He's mm. causing us an awful lot of problems. And that wouldn't just be a problem for you. It'd be a problem for all your colleague doctors who are working with you in a hospital. So I just wonder whether, and I don't mean this to be rude, but whether ego uh, and, and sort of personal profile are perhaps sort of getting in the way of the best way you can do your work. No, I don't think that's I don't I don't think that's correct because I I am not egotistical. I do not want to to push myself forward. I'm basically just standing up for people that sh that have been severely uh, almost destroyed, and I, I that's what I'm standing up for. I'm not standing up for anything else. I'm not standing up for myself. I want to do it. I want to say that there's been a complete uh, conflagration of of international humanitarian law. Doctors have been killed, hospitals have been bombed. Uh, the international humanitarian law is there to, to, to be subscribed to. Geneva Conventions should, are there for a reason. They're not there to, be dis, to, to just be walked over and be laughed at. And because that's what's actually happening now. Uh, the President Putin and President Assad are just laughing at the West uh, and because nobody is standing up and doing anything. But let me push you on this politics point a little bit further. Because of the strong feelings you have, and goodness knows they come over loud and clear in, in this interview, you have actually said that you believe the Western powers, and obviously you're speaking mostly about Britain where you're a citizen, should have militarily intervened much earlier in Syria. You say, I think, that the, the golden moment of opportunity might have even been in 2013, a long time ago now. But you've made it clear that, in your view, Western military boots on the ground were required, are required, to offer salvation to the people of Syria. And again, this point, is it right for a doctor to be actually calling for new expanded military intervention when wars always cost lives 
I called for humanitarian corridors in 2013. I called for United Nations humanitarian corridors. And I called, you asked me the question back in 2013, who's going to police that? And I said, well, it has to be boots on the ground. Now, it had to be United Nations boots on the ground and not militarily boots on the ground from Britain or US. What I was saying in 2013 also, that you know, we, when Obama said we'd crossed a red line, uh, that they'd crossed a red line by dropping chemical weapons in Ghouta and killing 1,500 people, that, you know, that there was a time whereby the West should have shown some leadership, should have shown some sincerity towards the Syrian people. But what about today? Because we've just talked graphically about the situation in Aleppo. What do you think should be done today? So, I don't think boots on the ground are the right thing to do today. What should happen today is that, of course, the uh, Al-Nusra Front uh, have changed their name to Al-Sham, have decided not to go with uh, Al-Qaeda, and they've got a huge amount of, uh, of people on the ground now. I think what should really happen is that the Western governments, uh, we're talking about Europe, I'm talking about all the Western governments, should come together and say, look, we cannot have Three, uh, thir um, 300,000 people in Aleppo um, being killed and uh, under siege. And what should happen is that I think that the Western government should first of all put pressure on, massive pressure on Putin to say you cannot just uh, use air power and kill as many people as you want to kill. You, you know, what you're doing is, is a war crime and you will be held responsible and you will be taken to The Hague in due course by the international community and so will President Assad. You will both be taken to The Hague. So you can smile now but, it won't ha but, but things will get worse later. And it's international pressure that needs to be put on um, the Russian regime. And not only that, we should also, I think, be talking to the uh, Al-Sham, the, the new um, groups of fighters that are now in Aleppo, we should be talking to those people. Uh, that's what I think we should do. That's laid out your political sort of diagnosis, but let's bring you back to doctoring for the very end. You did say those years ago, you said, you know what, I have made a conscious decision not to have a family, a wife, children, because I couldn't do what I want to do if I was in that family situation. Well, now, you know, you've been blessed with not just a wife, but a, a one-year-old daughter. Does that mean your days of active war doctoring are over? Probably. Uh, I think that, you know, I have a great responsibility now towards my wife and daughter. Um, I feel that I can voice uh, for the people that, that are being severely wounded and injured around the world. I can go and train doctors uh, that that can give the best uh, the, of their abilities to, to help people wherever they are. I could, I, when I was in the Yemen recently, I, it was a still a uh, small war zone, it wasn't a big war zone, and I will still go to places which I can realise the security is going to be uh, not too bad, but though places like Aleppo now, I, I don't think I could go again. Because you, I can relate to this as a former war reporter, you have talked about the adrenaline, the buzz, you know, it's not just altruism, but there is something incredibly life enhancing and powerful about risking all to do the job you believe in. You, you don't have that anymore. Oh, I do. Oh, I do. I do. I just suppress it. I have to suppress it because if I don't suppress it, then, then I'll be letting my family down. David Knott, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, David. It's a real pleasure to have you back in the studio. Oh, thanks very much, Steve.